Number eight, the Reichenbach Falls. Talk about the Reichenbach Falls. Number eight, the Reichenbach Fall. The Reichenbach Fall. Number eight. <laughs> Hi everybody, welcome to The Mild Rumpus and welcome to the House of Flimsy, AKA my dilapidated one bedroom apartment here in New York City that is filled with books and noise. When I first started this channel, MJ told me that I need to work on my about page and kind of work on the branding. And I sat down yesterday and, and started working on it and I realized I'm the, I'm the antithesis of the internet's resident librarian. Like if you are looking for an attractive, articulate young man decked in Dior going to exotic locations and beautiful Airbnbs. This, this maybe is not the channel for you. We're having a snowstorm here in New York. So today is a snow day. I'm not going anywhere. And lucky for me, Melinda from A Web of Stories tagged me in the Homes is Where the Heart is tag. She's the same person who created the Girl Scout cookie tag that I did last week. If you haven't seen that video, make sure you watch that one. Uh, I just saw Kindle and Kicks and Alex on a bridge posted their responses to my tag. I tagged them and they, you know, you know how tags work. This tag was originated by Mark over at Book Time with Elvis, which I have to give a shout out. This whole channel would never have happened if it weren't for Mark. He made a video called Booktube Needs You. And uh, that really was the catalyst and the motivation that I needed to get off my butt and finally make a YouTube channel. I had been lurking for several years and just that day I thought, well, we're almost at the end of January, maybe I'll do it next year. And you know, then this one just popped up in my recommended videos. I watched it and I went, okay, you convinced me. Let's go for it. And I got up and made my first video right then and there. So thank you, Mark. I'll link both videos. Uh, in the description. Now I have to admit, I do feel a bit like a hypocrite because I haven't been doing the reading challenge that accompanies this tag, um, but I'm getting through my February TBR pretty quick. I own a copy of Sherlock Holmes, the complete Sherlock Holmes, so it's not an impossibility. Stranger things have happened. So I have a stack of books here to share with you. Um, it really is a smorgasbord of genres. We've got children's lit, classics, thrillers, sci-fi, even a play or two. So there's something for everyone. Admittedly, mystery is not one of my go-to genres. I'm trying to change that this year. Uh, I read an Agatha Christie book here and there. I read that young adult book, One of Us is Lying. As a kid, I enjoyed the Cat Who series by Lillian Jackson Braun. But other than that, I haven't really read much mystery. If you know of any good ones, let me know. All right, let's jump into the tag. Number one, elementary, my dear Watson. Share a classic mystery novel that you consider a must read. This first book is a classic to me. I've never heard anyone else talk about it. I first read it when I was in elementary school and I've owned this copy since I was seven years old. That is Stories to Solve, Folk Tales from Around the World, told by George Shannon and illustrated by Peter Cease. As a kid, this is a book that I would revisit all the time. It was this and Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. I was lucky enough to have lunch with the author and they signed the book to me, which is pretty nifty. And look, this is evidence of me always being a book nerd from day one. That's my fake Dewey Decimal System. Oh, and look, it was checked out again in April of 1991. What a dork. I don't think anyone's gonna get super upset if I share a story with you. I don't even think this book is in print anymore. This is my favorite story out of the whole collection. It's called Heaven and Hell. People are always wishing, but once in China, a man got his wish, which was to see the difference between heaven and hell before he died. When he visited hell, he saw tables crowded with delicious food, but everyone was hungry and angry. Today we would call that hangry. They had food, but they were forced to sit several feet from the table and use chopsticks three feet long that made it impossible to get any food into their mouths. When the man saw heaven, he was very surprised for it looked the same. Big tables of delicious food. People forced to sit several feet from the table and use three foot chopsticks that made it impossible to get any food into their mouths. It was exactly like hell, but in heaven, the people were well fed and happy. Why? I'm just gonna tickle your taint and make you wait till the end of this video to hear the answer, but you be thinking about that. We'll, we'll, we'll find out at the end. Don't let me forget, because I probably will. Number two, Baker Street Irregulars. Recommend a book with a group of unlikely heroes 
or a diverse ensemble cast. Okay, one more children's book and then we're done. We're done with the kids. But this was the first book that popped into my mind and it's one of my most beloved classic books. Not to get dark, but this is the book that kind of taught me about life and death. And that is Charlotte's Web by E.B. White. I feel like this is one of those books that we just take for granted. It is such a beautiful book. And if you haven't read it, where have you been? Wilbur, the pig, and Charlotte, Templeton. Mm -hmm. I love this book. In fact, I'm gonna go put it on its shelf where it belongs. Number three, The Game is Afoot. Name a book that had a plot twist or revelation that completely surprised you. For this one, I have two plays to discuss. I don't have physical copies to, to show you, but the first one is Veronica's Room by Ira Levin. Veronica's Room is chocked full of twists and turns. There's not just one plot twist, there are many. The play is set in 1973. There's a young woman named Susan who's in a restaurant with her boyfriend, and she's approached by these two Irish middle-aged people who say that they're, they're the caretakers of a woman named Sissy. Sissy is elderly and senile, and she's more than likely on her way out, but she's just struggling mentally with things that have been unresolved in her life, one being her sister Veronica, who passed away when she was young. The couple tells Susan that she looks exactly like Veronica, and they convince her to go home with them, dress up like Veronica, pretend to be Veronica, to give Sissy a sense of closure so that she can pass in peace. What could possibly go wrong? The second play I want to talk about is The Pillow Man by Martin McDonough. This is a play about a man named Katorian. He is a writer of fiction and a lot of his stories involve violence towards children. Katorian's been brought in to be interrogated by police because there have been several recent murders of children and the details of the murders are very similar to things that he has written in his books. So the majority of the play is the interrogation, but throughout the play, there are also reenactments of the stories that he has written. And it gets extremely disturbing and creepy and quite honestly terrifying. I feel like both of these plays have scripts that you can appreciate as a reader. You don't necessarily have to see performances of them. Um, and I know my theater. I go to a lot of theater. Trust me on this one. Those two plays, if you want two creepy plays with lots of plot twists, check those two out. I know what I'm talking about, I promise. All right, number four, 221 Baker Street. Talk about a time you visited somewhere of literary significance. I have a few. It's so funny we were just talking about theater because this guy also writes plays. You may have heard of him. His name is Shakespeare. I visited Stratford-upon-Avon where he was born. And then I also went to uh, the Globe Theater, which is not the actual Globe Theater. The real Globe Theater burned to the ground. But uh, I was in London when they were still building or reconstructing the Globe Theater, so I got to visit that as well. During that same trip, I went to Oscar Wilde's grave in Paris. I know there were other famous authors buried in that cemetery. So many people are buried there. Jim Morrison's buried there. Another really cool place I visited was Elizabeth's Orphanage in New Orleans. At the time, Anne Rice owned it, and it's where she lived and worked, and she threw all these crazy parties. The place was filled with religious iconography, and there was one room that was dedicated to her enormous doll collection. And what was super creepy is that she had a bunch of um, vampire dolls that people had sent her, and I guess some that she had purchased, but man, was that a creepy room. You would not want to be there at night. And then here in New York, one day I was in Tribeca. I was on my way to the New York Law School and I just stumbled on Lispinard Street where A Little Life takes place. And I had just finished reading that book. So I was like, <laughs> but my favorite place to visit here in New York, if you live here or if you are visiting, make sure you go to the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. It's a very unusual church. I believe it's the largest Gothic cathedral in the world. And it's also known as St. John the Unfinished because it just 
they've been building this thing forever and, it, and there's no end in sight. There's so much to see. First of all, it's, it's enormous. You can literally fit the Statue of Liberty inside the cathedral. It's a very art-centric church. If you're not religious, you'll still get a kick out of, out of going. Uh, some of the very last work that Keith Haring did is there. So many famous authors had their funeral services there. James Baldwin, Allen Ginsberg, Toni Morrison. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get to go to the memorial service of Joan Didion, who was buried there. This is the program that they handed out. Let me share that with you real quick. You might get a kick out of that. But excellent place to visit if you are a fan of art and literature. I'm gonna put this back where it's supposed to go too. Number five, Moriarty's Master Plan. Discuss a book where the antagonist was exceptionally cunning and memorable. Well, for this book, I chose our dear friend Hannibal Lecter from The Silence of the Lambs. Number six, The Art of Deduction. Mention a book that kept you guessing all the way to the end or one where you guessed the outcome earlier on. Well, one book that kept me guessing all the way to the end is probably the quintessential mystery, and that is And There Were None by Agatha Christie. And then a book that I did figure out who done it was Razorblade Tears by S.A. Cosby. However, it did not take away from my enjoyment of the book. This is a really good crime novel about two ex-cons who are brought together when their sons, who were a married couple, are murdered. And in the book, they have to kind of confront their own prejudices, racism, homophobia. Everyone that I've recommended this book to has really, really enjoyed it. I'm reading his second book that he wrote right now called Blacktop Wasteland that is just as interesting and good. <clears throat> Let me get a sip of water. My voice is going. My water is Diet Coke, by the way. Number seven, The Hound of the Baskervilles. Talk about a book with a strong atmospheric setting or one where the setting plays a significant role in the story. The first book that pops into my head is The Road by uh, Cormac McCarthy, but I've been talking about him so much that I don't want to, well, I guess I just did. But the book I really want to talk about is Lucifer's Hammer. This is one of my all-time favorite books, five-star read. Uh, it's about a comet that slams into the earth, completely destroys civilization. This book really changed the way that I view the world and the universe. And you see how everything is connected and our existence is kind of dependent on a domino effect. Like, yikes. Number eight, The Reichenbach Falls. Talk about a series that you thought had ended, but made a surprise comeback. I couldn't think of a series, but there were several standalone novels that I thought had concluded, but then all of a sudden, ah, we're not done. There's a sequel. More than likely it's a cash grab, but here we go. They both die at the end. Okay, The Handmaid's Tale, but the worst out of all of them, in my opinion. To Kill a Mockingbird. We didn't need a sequel. And we certainly didn't need to find out that Atticus Finch was a racist. Number nine, Sherlockian adaptations. Discuss your favorite book to screen adaptation or a retelling of a classic story. God, there are so many. The ones that come to mind immediately are The Princess Bride, The Godfather, Jaws, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, The Wizard of Oz. There's, there's so many. I think the one I'm gonna talk about and the one that I really like might be a little controversial because I know the author absolutely detests the movie, and that is The Shining by Stephen King. And let's just take a moment to appreciate how that book does shine. I think what Kubrick did with Stephen King's story is what a great musician does when they take on a cover song. Now, granted, he may or may not have read the source material. I'll give you that. But you can't deny that Kubrick's fingerprints are on every frame of that film. It's just so iconic. If you say The Shining, think of the images that come to mind. You've got Jack Nicholson with the ax. Here's Johnny. You've got the crazy carpet. You've got the twins. Play with us, Danny. And people are still analyzing it and dissecting the symbolism and finding hidden meanings. Just yesterday on Facebook, I saw um, a post where someone was discussing the scene where Danny is watching television and they notice that there's no cord running from the television to the wall. And look, I know Stephen King has his panties in a twist because we didn't have the dancing topiaries, but hands down, it's one of the greatest horror films of all time. All right, last question, number 10. The Great Detective, recommend a book with a brilliant and memorable protagonist. 
You will see in my weekly wrap up that I post on Sunday, I searched high and low. I went through the closets, I went through the kitchen cabinets, I looked under the bed, I looked everywhere for this book and I finally decided it must be back home in Texas or in my storage unit. And obviously I'm not going out in the snowstorm to grab this book. So I'll just put the little graphic here through the magic of the internet. Um, the character that I chose was Christopher John Francis Boone, who is a 15 year old a uh, kid with high-functioning autism, Asperger's syndrome, and uh, the book is The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. Christopher is very brilliant in this book. He's obsessed with math and numbers. Uh, the chapters only use prime numbers, and I mean, you don't have to do much to impress me when it comes to math. I can barely add, subtract, and multiply. I can sometimes divide. I learned a lot reading this book. <laughs> Another memorable character that came to my mind was Patrick Bateman from American Psycho. Brett Easton Ellis kind of poking fun at the Wall Street bro, the 80s yuppie. Uh, I don't know how brilliant he is, but he certainly was memorable. And that does it for the Holmes is where the heart is tag. Thanks again, Melinda, for tagging me. Thank you, Mark, for creating it. Before I tell you who I'm going to tag, I'm gonna give you the answer to our mystery. Okay, so you might remember, we visited heaven, we visited hell, they looked exactly the same. People were sitting around a table, eating with chopsticks that were 13 feet long. In hell, people were hangry. In heaven, people were happy and well-fed. How? Here's the answer. In heaven, they were feeding each other. Aw. And speaking of feeding, make sure you feed that algorithm. Subscribe, make a comment, hit the like, hit the bell, do the things. It helps get the video out there. Thank you. And last but not least, these are the folks that I would like to tag to do this video. If I tag you, you're under no obligation. This is just me shining the spotlight on your channel. I'll put everyone's handles down below in the description. Hopefully you'll pick up some subscribers. These are all booktube newbies, much like myself. Uh, so we've got Books with Jeff and Jen's Reading Life. Both of these booktubers specialize in mysteries. Uh, so I read this book, Magic Within Words. Sammy Tass, who just had a brand new daughter, and they were readers. They're two friends that are doing the book channel together. Super cool idea. And uh, a booktuber I just discovered last night, I was really excited to find her, uh, is Indoor Cat. She's a fellow New Yorker, and uh, her, her New York experience does not look like the House of Flimsy. I'm very jealous of those beautiful brick walls. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you next time. Bye.